the chain rule from differential calculus. How comfortable are you with it, really? Is it the kind of thing that just sort of flows smoothly off your pen as you're working your way through various equations, or do you kind of stutter and stall? Let me tell you a little story. I was 16 years old. I was in high school, and there was a boy who was doing integral calculus, so I figured if any guy can do it, I can do it too. And I hadn't realized that I could just sort of zip my way through the algebra book, but I did that. And then I got myself a book on calculus. Actually, Daddy got it for me. He got it from the math department, and he was in the chemistry department at the local university. So there I am, plugging my way through this big, heavy calculus tome. And this is my summer vacation experience. And I got held up at the chain rule. I could figure out a bunch of things up until then, but when it came to the chain rule, I had to go find a professor who would, like, you know, do the blackboard thing and write out all the equations on the blackboard, and then I could follow it. And it made perfectly beautiful sense. It was elegant, straightforward, obviously logical and intuitive at the same time when you have somebody explaining it to you. Now, our next step, if you're following me with the series of videos that we have here on back propagation, is that we need to do our mise en scène preparation. We need to do all of our little chain rule steps, each one of them comprising a very specific differential task. I keep using the phrase partial differential. Don't let you throw that off. It's still the same kind of differential calculus. It's a little Greek delta y with a delta x as compared to a dy dx, but the mechanics, the mathematical processes are exactly the same. It's just that we're, when we have that little partial um, Greek, Greek letter, what it means is that we're taking the derivative with, with respect to one specific variable out of the possible number of variables that could be considered. So here we are. We're about to embark on this chain rule journey. At the end, we'll have all of our necessary components. This is part three of our multi-part journey into the back propagation for neural networks. And part zero, actually, was the rationale and motivation part. One was a table of contents. Part two, which I trust you've just gone through, was setting up the word problem. In other words, creating that very initial partial differential equation, which we will then solve to get the answer. But we had to go through that word problem process of not only um, solving the word problem, but constructing the word problem that has to get solved. So here we are. It is very early. It is still rooster hours, which is why, although this series is officially AI after hours, it's early morning and we're having very good Kona coffee as opposed to a Mai Tai. Join me. The focus for this entire series is on the back propagation training method. Throughout this, we're going to work with just a very simple multilayer perceptron consisting of an input layer, a middle or hidden, and an output layer. In this particular vid, we're moving on to part three where we address the chain rule. In the previous vid, we introduced the notion of dependency. That is, we were going to take the partial derivative of the sum squared error, that's SSE, with respect to a specific connection weight. The key insight that we obtained in that last vid was that we needed to introduce a differentiable transfer function into computing the outputs of our neural network process. This is the insight that Paul Werbus made and applied to neural networks in his Harvard PhD dissertation in 1974. Once we understand that we need a differentiable transfer function as opposed to a simple bi-state one, then it's implicit in that understanding that we're going to use the chain rule to carry out the differentiation involved in finding how the sum squared error depends on each connection weight. In videos five and six of this series, we're going to take a look at how the SSE depends on the hidden to output connection weights, and then separately, a, a different derivation and somewhat more complex, we'll look at the dependence of the SSE on the input to hidden connection weights. Let me take a quick sidebar here. I'm introducing a notation change, and this is just for the nodes in the output layer. Instead of denoting them as running from zero up through 
O minus 1, where O stands for the total number of nodes in the output, we're going to run them from 0 up through K minus 1. And that's just because when the typeset gets small, sometimes it's easy to confuse an O with a 0. So we're just switching to K instead. So let's move on. What we're after is enough of the chain rule from first semester differential calculus to be able to do the mechanics of what we're setting up as our next step. And the key question that we're after is, how do we compute the dependence of the sum squared error on each individual connection weight? So you've seen this equation several times. I use it often when I'm trying to express the totality of what we're after. And that top row of the equation is all the different terms involved as we break down that dependent. So you can see that there's several different partial differential equations. What we want out of this particular vid is the is just to refresh our mathematical memory so that we know how to carry out each of those little derivatives. So what we're going to do is go from our basic equation showing the dependence of the sum squared error on a given connection weight to the full expression for that. And the mechanism that we need to do this thing is the chain rule from differential calculus. I've got a book in progress. It has all the equations that I'm referencing here. So if you want a nice hard copy or digital copy of everything worked out in textbook style, please go to my website, alianajmaren.com. Please use the book tab that's in the menus. It'll take you to a page where shortly after the top, there is an orange looking box and find the link there that takes you to the table of contents. All of the material in this backpropagation series is in part two. So back to our work. We're after that dependence of the sum squared error on a connection weight. Just remember that this Greek partial notation is the same kind of mathematics as using a straightforward derivative. I went through that a little bit more in the previous vid. So we're going to start with dy dx and we're going to recall that we can write y as a function of x. What's going to hold our interest here is that y cannot just be a simple function of x, but y can be a function of a function. So we could say that instead of y being f of x, we could say that y is f of g of x. Here's a real simple example. Let's say that g of x, the internal function, is 3x plus 1, and that f of x is we take a function and square it. So f of g of x is squaring 3x plus 1. Before we put these two derivatives together, let's just recall basic calculus and work them out very quick. We recall that if we're taking the derivative of something that is to a power with respect to that thing, like d of q to a power c with respect to q, then it's going to be that power, in our case c, times that thing that we're taking the derivative of that is now to the power of c minus 1. So if we have d of q squared with respect to q, our derivative is 2q. Now I'm using q here because q is going to be replaced as we do this composition with another function. So I didn't want to be using x because we're going to substitute a function of x into q. On the right side here, let's say that we have the derivative of something multiplying our variable x plus another term, and we're taking the, res the derivative of that with respect to x. When we do that, we drop the scalar additive term because it's not a function of x. And then we take a look at dA of x dx, and that's just a. In other words, a is a slope of the line. So here in the example, when we have our internal function being 3x plus 1, the derivative of that with respect to x is 3. Now we compose these. We're going to have the original dy dx, and it is the derivative of a function of a function of x. And when we apply the chain rule, what we do is we split that composed expression into two parts. We take the derivative of f with respect to its internal function, and then we take the derivative of that internal function with respect to x. And suppose that we have three of these things. We have dy dx is the derivative of f of g of h of x. In other words, three functions, f, g, and h. So you take the derivative of f with respect to g, the derivative of g with respect to h, and the derivative of h with respect to x. Essentially, it's turtles all the way down. We've just established a general framework for doing chain rule derivatives 
In the next video, we'll apply this process to the specific steps that we need for the backpropagation derivation. See you soon, and thank you.